BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello. In 1762, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote Emile, or On Education, which he considered his greatest work. Emile is partly a novel, partly a treatise on how to make children immune from the corruption, as he saw it, of civilization, mainly by letting them work things out for themselves, rather than telling them what to do. Only then would they learn self-respect and free themselves from the self-consciousness which he found throughout society and which led inevitably, he thought, to unhappiness. Quote, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains, he wrote his most famous sentence. We need to discuss Rousseau on education are Dennis McManus, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southampton, Caroline Warman, Professor of French Literature and Thought at Jesus College, Oxford, and Richard Wartmore, Professor of Modern History at the University of St Andrews and Co-Director of St Andrews Institute of Intellectual History. Richard Wartmore, can you tell us about his childhood, Rousseau's childhood? Yes, Rousseau is born in 1712. His mother was rich. His father was a relatively poor artisan. Uh, A disaster occurs because Rousseau's mother dies after a couple of days after his birth. And he subsequently has a, a turbulent education himself. The fact that's of profound significance is that he's born at Geneva. Now, it's very important because it's an independent republic. Some people still call the Genevans Swiss. They were not Swiss until 1815. They're fiercely patriotic. They have a militia. They build their republican walls around the city. Uh, It's the centre for Calvinism as well. So the fact that the pastors are involved in the lives of the citizens is important. And it's also a place of commerce. So you have a tension between money and morality. And the morality is very strictly needed. A turbulent childhood, turbulent education, till he was about 16. What was turbulent about it? It was turbulent because his father is forced through poverty to move from the upper town at Geneva, which is where his mother's house uh, was. He he moves to the lower town where the, the artisans live. His father, when Rousseau's 10, runs away. He abandons uh, Geneva because he's involved in in an altercation with a rich man who he strikes in the face with a sword. And that means that Rousseau is returned to his rich relations, but as, as the poor relation himself. So he is tutored by a Calvinist outside Geneva, and then he becomes a, an apprentice engraver for three years, and that is miserable. What was the standard way of educating a child of his background at that time? He was landing in the well-off part of his family, so what would they normally do? Well, you would have a private tutor and the private tutor would more than likely be a clergyman. So one of the, the main differences, really, with regard to education is the, is the direct relationship between religion and education, either the idea that you have to stamp out sin or that you educate somebody to be reasonable, you know, reasonable idea of Christianity, for example, um, or, obviously, teach somebody to be good, which is obviously Rousseau's idea. And it was very much sit in a desk for hours on end, don't move much, not much physical exercise, and do what I say and learn by rote. Is it that sort of thing? Not in Rousseau's case, actually, because he, uh, when he was uh, educated with the private tutor, when he's with his richer relations, the private tutor took it, takes him out into the mountains... And that, but that what I said. That mean, in, but is that was the normal way that people were going about education in those days? Certainly, in lots and lots of places. Yeah. Yes, okay, and then he no had a private tutor and went into the mountains. Yes, and that's his love of his love of nature. His love of botany is stimulated. Also, he admits at one point that he enjoys the sister of the clergyman who's teaching him spanks him, and he thinks that that excites him as a boy. It's one of the things that he confesses to in his confessions one of his posthumously published works. All right. Does that lead to anything? Well, it leads to a great deal, because obviously for Rousseau, confessing your your sins, but not doing it in the manner of St Augustine, 
is is a which means what? Importance. That's a throwaway line. You're not going to get away with. What does it mean? But not in the manner of Saint Augustine. <laughs> well, the idea of confessing your sin uh, is something that you need to do, but with the idea in the back of your mind that you are good. So you confess sin, but you're a good person. You have the capacity to be, to still behave in a natural fashion in accordance with the natural passions, which is something that Rousseau is obsessed with. OK, thank you. Caroline, Caroline Warman. Um, can, we t- can we go into that education a bit more? I mean, what is he actually learning? He leaves when he's 16 and he goes to live with a woman in her late 20s, uh, <laughs> who, who is his both... Um, uh, looks after him and then he looks after him. Uh, uh, so what, what did he learn? What was he learning? Well, what he was learning with Madame de Varens, uh, um, <coughs> apart from on the emotional side, um, was to use her library. And he, he is an amazing autodidact. So he taught himself absolutely everything. And while he was with her, he wasn't with her just systematically all the time. He kept on going away. He pretended to be a music master. He was... With uh, some mixed success. I mean, he did all the music in the, encycla- the great French yeah, encyclopedia. Yeah, but that was later, so... Yeah, but he's, he's still been, he, getting training for it then, I presume. Yes, he's training for it. So he's a good it. musician. He was a brilliant musician and a composer as well. But in that time, when he was being a music master, he was also being a footman. He was being a secretary. He pretended to be an English Jacobite called Dudding. You know, he had a number of lives that were all happening simultaneously when he was a very young man. Let's nail what he knew when he was saying his early 20s. What did he know about which these books he read? Tons of books. What is, which tons? Which, which books, tons? really? <laughs> he read uh, m- much tons of, 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 of classical works, classical history and classical works, yeah, and Stoics. And obviously he's obsessed with Plutarch's lives and he, he famously says that it turns him into something of a Roman. But while he was with Madame de Varenne, I mean, I've been slightly flippant about it, for, but wh- how did he emerge from that relationship? We, you know, we can read his confessions and get his idea of what he was, well, which I'd is like a, very, a very sort of like raw and, and impulsive person who who loved reading and loved learning things and was passionate about his new sort of music notation system and, and passionate about women and very impulsive. But I, he also presented himself as a sort of like sort of natural bore, as like complete, not bore as in like very bore, Boring, but you know, uh, uh, like a sort of pig. You know, he was unable to, you know, behave properly in society, and he became. But he became a tutor. So we have this young man born up, born in a fierce Calvinist society, who then became a Catholic. He became a Catholic. How did that happen and when in his life? Um, he went to Turin and he um, needed to um, get somewhere to live and he tur- he became a, a Catholic in order to be able to live in a seminary. Why did he choose a seminary? There must have been <laughs> plenty of places to go to live. Why did he choose that? Well, I mean, what's available for a young man with no money? The, I mean, he left Geneva. He didn't say, OK, well, it's time for me, a young Jean-Jacques, to, you know, go forth in the world. He came back to Geneva one, one evening and the, the city gates were closed and he just couldn't get back in. So he just went off in the opposite direction. I mean, it was a huge amount of happenstance. And then he went to Paris. Yes. Uh, which he didn't like. He went to Paris to try and find Madame de Varin, so he was always trying to find her. So he went there to meet her, but she'd already left, so then he stayed there for a bit and then he came back again. Um, and they were, they were very happily together in this beautiful house that he talks about with, with great joy and nostalgia called Les Charmettes in Savoy for about four years. And then, I don't know what happened, really. He sort of passes over it. I think they got a bit bored of each other. And off he went to be to be a tutor to these two little boys, six and seven. And he said, you know, given what an incredibly sweet-tempered person I am, I would have been a brilliant tutor if I hadn't got so incredibly angry with the boys all the time. (laughs) (laughs) But just finally, he's in Paris, and he's that where he gets the taste and the anti-taste for civilization. Does he see this as a the city as a corrupt place, as a place that, uh, that you should not grow up to live in? I think that's. I think he develops that particular line later. later um, yeah. I, I don't think at that point he had it. I think he was extremely excited to be in Paris. Okay, <laughs> let's put, 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 Dennis Dennis McManus. Let's follow that line. Uh, discourse on inequality in in uh, seventeen fifty four. Yeah. Can you bring that into play? Yeah, sure. So. Um, 
in a way, it's, it's a work that, that sets the stage for Emile, which we'll, I take it we'll spend most of our time on, um, and the social contract. Um, and um, what it provides is a kind of speculative history which explains why we're in the mess we're in now. So he looks at society as it was for him then, I'm sure you'd think the same of ours, and he thinks that what you see is you see like a mob of duplicitous self-aggrandizers in competition with each other, desperate to fulfil superficial desires for luxury and so forth. And he sees this, in, in some respects, he thinks that when you look at life in our kind of society... Um, you might well believe with somebody like a Thomas Hobbes that um, you know that there'd be a war of each against all, as Hobbes puts it, um, if these people um, were, as were, let off the leash. But where Rousseau and Hobbes differ is that Rousseau thinks that this is not, if you like, um, a window on what human beings essentially are, naturally are. And what he does in the in the discourse on inequality is he tells a story about how we come from what he thinks of as a relatively um, innocent state of nature, an original position, original situation in which human beings found themselves, where they have a kind of self-love, he calls it amour de soi, which is to do with... It's, it's just the, the kind of self-love, the kind of care for the self that, if you like, any organism has to have just to stay intact. We also have a certain kind of uh, capacity for compassion. And we have very basic desires. So we want shelter, we want a mate, we want food, but we have very simple desires so we're not really in competition with each other because in a way there's nothing much to compete over. And he believes that this is natural and that if you behave in a natural way you, you are therefore innocent and you are immunised against the evils that Hobbes said society was full of. Yes, well he certainly thought that man in that natural condition would certainly, you, you would not find the kind of conflict that Hobbes thinks is inevitable. Unfortunately, we don't stay in that, in that condition. And he thinks that certain kind of foreign causes, as he puts it, which is, you know, uh, barren years, long, hard winters and so on, force us to start cooperating with each other. Because in, the, in that original state of nature, we, re, we live a relatively independent life. And we're forced to start cooperating with each other, and this starts to have all sorts of complex psychological effects on us. And we start having private property, which, as he says, arouses jealousy and off we go. Absolutely. So that's, that's one of the, the, if you like, the further stages on, in our degeneration. What, what seems to happen at first is we, we, we start organising with one another, we, we start hunting at, in groups, we become aware of the way in which we're superior to the animals, we also become aware of how some of us are better at hunting than others. And we start thinking about ourselves... Um, in terms of this, the, if like these comparisons between one, between one another, we start thinking about the way in which we're seen by others, and this gives rise to if like a kind of toxic kind of self love. How did this idea of man born free everywhere has been changed? The idea of the innocence coming into the world and be destroyed by the yeah. world into which it comes. How far was this radical at the time? How far did he make it radical by the emphasis he put on it? Well, I suppose in in, in one respect, I think he thought this was just an implication of his of his religious views. So I think he thinks that you know everything that comes from the hand of the But creator, was this current it? at the time or was he striking out on his own and people said no it's not like that. Well he's certainly clashing with people like Hobbes. Mm. So Hobbes has certainly has this this vision of human beings as essentially egoists, essentially self-interested and what Rousseau is going to try and argue is that that only comes later as part of this kind of degeneration. Mm. Um, and he has this notion of amour propre, which is this other kind of self-love, which is where uh, you, you're no longer just concerned with, if you like, keeping body and soul together, you're, com you're concerned to compete with others, and you want to be in the first position, as he puts it. You want to be seen as better than others. Richard, what more? Uh, can you briefly outline Emile, the book, for our listeners? Yes. It's... A difficult read. <laughs> it's in some ways meant to be read out loud and then discussed. That's what contemporaries did. There are five books. They tell the story of Emile's life with his tutor, and the tutor is Jean-Jacques, and the tutor guides Emile to avoid the corruptions of society and to remain good. And the idea, which we've already raised, is that society can be an arena, but it ought to be a forum. And cooperation makes you happy. Emile is, moves from 
infancy and his first relationships with the natural world and animals, through his first relations with other people. Jean-Jacques the tutor is very Jean -Jacques careful... Jean-Jacques, that being Rousseau himself. Yeah. It is Rousseau yeah. himself. is very careful about his meeting other people. That really can only happen in the, in the mid-teenage years. Uh, but... And then ideas about religion are introduced, and then finally he's ready to become a citizen and an adult. I think a lot of listeners were surprised to know that he, he, he wasn't very keen on children reading books. He wanted them to experience the difficulties of life, making things, trying to make things, failing in things, playing, uh, socialising with that. But he, at one stage he says, I hate books. Um, so what's all that about? And he's not, he's not allowed to read a book until it's about, you tell me, it's about 13 or something, and that's Robinson Crusoe to teach you how to sort of put your life together out of scraps. I think the point is, and, and Dennis has, has, has already said, that necessity is important. That's really what we should what be focusing mean? on... It, it means that you only respond really to practical circumstances and you only really learn if you have to. You can fill your head with a lot of facts and information, but if it's not practically useful, what's the point? And it can also be dangerous because it can lead you to egoism, it can lead you to conflict and take you away from cooperation. You have to not be servile, that's one of the main messages, but you must not be imperious either. And books can take you away from what he might have called, in our terms anyway, the real world perhaps. Caroline, Caroline Warman, what, what was startling about uh, Rousseau's views about raising infants for that time? Uh, infants, well, he particularly wished uh, women to breastfeed their own children. And so he wished the practice of wet nurses to stop. Um, he said that the relationship, the bond between mother and child would be much stronger if they breastfed their own children and the, ch the children themselves would be healthier. And he has some um, horrendous pictures, I mean, word pictures of little babies in swaddling clothes sort of hung from hooks in the ceiling in villages while, you know, the woman has gone off to do something and these little children are just sort of stifling and possibly dying. So, so that wanted. was startling. That, that was, that's a start. What else? What else? He said he wanted children to run around a lot so they, and run around and play. I mean, you mentioned it already in this sort of question about, like, not being sitting, not sitting down and, like, learning loads of stuff um, until you're 12 was really important. And he said he made up this. He was endlessly making up people who were disagreeing with him as a sort of dialogue. He says, you will think that, you know, this person is doing nothing. Is it nothing to be happy? He said, so he said, imagine what it was like for these little kids to be running around and Jumping and playing, they'll never, be, they'll never be so busy in the rest of their lives. Which and you is said sort of they sweet. were learning to be children. Yes, they're learning to be children. It's a beautiful phrase, you know, laisser mourir l'enfance dans l'enfance. So al allow childhood to mature and develop in the child rather than teach a little child to be a man. What impact did this have on the readers at the time? I think it had a huge impact um, because it was written so directly for all of the things that we could criticise Rousseau for, and I hope we will have a go at doing that in a minute. Um, you can't, you can't criticise what an amazing writer he is. He, you, you read him and you feel like he's talking directly to you. It's extremely emotional and direct. So parents read it and were very affected. And so changes started to come about and schools tried to change to, you know, to, to introduce some of his ideas. So we have this child, uh, Dennis McManus, who, until about 12, is not encouraged to read a single book, in, in, to, to play, uh, do things for himself, fail, start again, mm -hmm. <laughs> try for... And there's a tutor there, though, mm -hmm. and, and Rousseau calls the tutor <coughs> by his own name. So what's the tutor doing when all this is happening? Well, the role the tutor changes as the child gets older, but in a, perhaps the most interesting phase is that, is that very early phase um, that Caroline mentioned. In that phase, the the tutor is, in some respects, is just kind of staying out of the way, but also making sure that everybody else stays out of the way. Because Rousseau has this notion that you ha that the child is, if you like, a natural learner and should just go out and learn from nature. And what we what the 
um, tutor what it, needs. What it, sorry, I yeah. interrupt you. What does he mean by nature? I mean, go out into the woods and look around or, or build camps or jump rivers or yeah. swim or what, what's he on about? Yeah, do the lot. Do yeah. the lot. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, so essentially, you know, learning about the world um, around them and doing it without um, the, if you like, the intermediary role of you know, science textbooks telling the, the, the child what to think about, about nature. So he has this idea of negative education that he mentions sometimes. There's quite a lot of different aspects to that, to that idea, but one part of it is this notion of you have to make sure that the child is allowed, as the natural learner that they are, to get on with it. Now, um, clearly one of the things that the tutor is also doing, though, is a certain kind of manipulating of the environment that the child is in. So very early on, uh, I think some readers thought that there's something a little bit fishy about this, something a little bit suspicious about this. Um, and, and Rousseau himself can't quite resist um, encouraging this thought. So he, he talks about the way in which um, what the tutor will do, although in one sense the tutor is off the scene, what they're actually doing is that they are um, c- making captive the, the will of the child. So in a sense... Um, you know, the, the, the tutor is going beyond just, just controlling the behaviour of the child. He's controlling what the child is interested in, what they see, um, by, if you like, managing that environment around them. Um, now, I think what, what Rousseau would probably say in response to that is, um, you know, this isn't manipulation because what, what you're dealing with here with this child is, is not really yet a proper rational agent. Um, so the child, you know, he talks about... Um, the reasonable man is the masterpiece of education. It's what you get at the end of the process of education. So I think the kind of um, response that he'd make to this kind of manipulation charge is that he'd say, well, you know, you can't manipulate something that, um, if you like, doesn't have a judgment of its own yet. And what we're doing is we're forming it. We're nurturing this this child to the point where it will become, if you like, an independent, rational agent who can make their own decisions about how, they, how they're going to live. Richard Watmore, does the notion of reality enter into this relationship at all? I mean, is the one tutor to one child, and who's the child, and where does he roam around, and and uh, and so on and so forth? Uh, it sounds terrific, but how how is he going to work in? How do he, how does he envisage it, envisage it working? Well, it works. It works gradually, and you have to be very very careful to avoid. Contamination, I think, is 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 not an 18th century word, but it's the right one. Because if the child generates a sense of self that is egocentric, then you're lost. In a sense, you're creating Paris in the child, and that's that's the worst possible thing. You've got to in a sense, keep the child in the canton, in the at the bottom of the of the Swiss mountain. You know that the air's pure, there's it's safe, and relationships are better. And coming back to this point about necessity, they're better because they're harder. Where life is easier, where there's temptation about, you have to be very careful. It's also the case that you're likely not to have forms of religious belief that are oppressive, which is which is another Where radical. Where are we now? Part. In the cantons or in the city? In the cantons. Mm. In the city, everything is terrible. <laughs> you know, you really if there's, if there's one message, and there's there is a, there's another book that he does recommend that people read, and it's Fenelon's Telemachus, and the message of that book is really that people, if they want to have good lives, need to abandon the cities and return to the countryside. And ultimately, that is something that Rousseau believed without thinking it could be ever ever be realised. I'm sorry to nag away and be pedantic, but what happens when you put it to the test? Well, when you put it to the test, the likelihood is that it's going to fail and it can only work for a very tiny proportion of the population. This isn't a this isn't a plan for a mass education system. Why not? I think when he says everybody's supposed to be born equal and have equal opportunities, uh, but that he's talking about an extraordinary elitist activity. Because the captivating thing about Rousseau is that he tells you how things ought to be, mm-hmm. and he also tells you that you can't get there, you can't reach your utopia. You have to accept that Paris is Paris, that that the world is corrupt, and that you can plan for a, a natural child in society 
and he's saying, obviously, his message isn't to get the human race to walk on all fours or to return to the woods, the attacks on him that were launched time after time. But this you're is happier the... as a savage... Yes. With, with the orangutans, I think they, they get a mention. They do. Yes. And obviously, the idea that animals are happier than humans because they live a more natural relationships, even though the lifespans are shorter, etc. Humans are the miserable ones because of what we do to each other. So it's a, it's a thought experiment, ultimately, but he doesn't think that it, it could... It could be the plan for anything other than actually a canton. Because obviously one of his points is we need to have small relationships in, in small communities, states. in so small states. A canton, Absolutely. A small small part states. of a small state. Yeah, yes. small states. Caroline, we've been talking about the boy Emil, and it is about Emil, and people are of their times. Girls don't get, they get short shrift, don't they? They do. So do, you want to, do you want to express yourself on that? I, I feel like I may wish to express myself on this. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, when we've been saying, you know, he, this boy and all the rest of it, I mean, it's that's not a sort of default gender in an old-fashioned way. It's, it's because it is a boy. Um, and so, you know, Russo does get to the idea of thinking about, you know, a little girl, but she doesn't need to be educated for herself exactly. She needs to be educated to be the perfect um, partner for Emil when he grows up. Um, and he, um, in his thinking about nature, he's very essentialist. So he says, um, women, like, let's have a look at the difference between women and men. So men are much cleverer, and then women, they're a little bit hysterical and all the rest of it, and there is motherhood and the home and all the rest of it. So, um, so he says that's what a girl, that's what the female sex is, and therefore that's what they need to be um, educated to be. Um, and, of course, they're, you know, a little bit, uh, liable to get overexcited about, you know, clothes and all of the rest of it. So they need to be kept away from those sorts of temptations and, and, and brought up with, you know, really not very many books, even fewer books, although, that, you know, Sophie is allowed to read Telemachus. Um, and then they can read some helpful books about housekeeping. Um, and that's going to be very interesting. But he'd written about Eloise before then, who was an extremely learned woman. Uh, how did he? How did this transfer to his view? It didn't transfer across his view Isn't of women. Isn't it so interesting? I mean, Rousseau is such a writer of paradoxes, and it's what makes it possible to forgive him some of the nonsense that he talks. So in the Emile, there is Sophie being, you know, very much constrained. But then he's just, as you say, he's just written Julie ou la nouvelle Eloise, where the heroine, Julie, is the absolute intellectual heart of the book as an educator as well. And there her lover, saint Preux and tutor learns from her and so does her husband learn from her. She's really the... She's the intellectual heart of it. So, yes, he does opposite things with different books. He tries out different ideas. Yes. Do you think he tries out different ideas for the hell of it? Or do you think it's just a, a, he's a man who keeps changing his mind? I mean, he's a Calvinist, then he's a Catholic, then he's a Protestant, then he's not a Protestant, and he's, in, he's having friendship with this person, and then not friendship with this person. Changing his mind seems to be part of his perpetual condition, doesn't it? I think he's in dialectic with himself over time. Are also our relationships between men and women dangerous, then? Well, I think in a way he thinks um, that they aren't as long as you are happy to accept um, the account of the sexes that he gives. So as long as um, men do what men should do, as dictated by nature, and, and women do what women do, we'll be fine. So I think in that sense, um, you know, if you're happy to accept that package, then I think he thinks social relations between men and women are fine. However, for us, it's a very big if, because for the kinds of reasons that Caroline has talked about... Can I come to you for the bomb that drops on Rousseau's life? Um, and it's his great rival, Voltaire, who paradoxically has moved to Geneva for some sort of safety. Uh, and um, they're at each other's throats a lot. They're, they're the two big bulls in the ring, uh, coming from different boxes. Now then, Voltaire intervened with the reputation of Rousseau in what could have been, was for a while, a catastrophic, with a catastrophic revelation. Could you tell us about it? Yes, Voltaire and Rousseau hate each other. They had been friends in the sense that they sent each other their work and Voltaire thought Rousseau was on his side. They come to believe that each other are they're so that their work is so dangerous 
that it will destroy their own mission. So Voltaire sees Rousseau as an enemy of enlightenment and Rousseau sees Voltaire as a supporter of tyranny. And because they're both involved in the politics at Geneva, where Rousseau is being accused of attacking the magistrates and of going against France, there's really an explosion. And information is fed to Voltaire about the fact that Rousseau had five children himself and he left them all at the, on the steps of the Foundling Hospital in Paris. So rather than educate or support his own children, he abandoned them. Rousseau had told very few people about that. Voltaire learns about it. He puts it into an anonymous pamphlet. Rousseau initially thinks it's a Calvinist pastor who's the author. And in some ways, it, sen it sends Rousseau mad. He's paranoid for the rest of his life. I mean, in some ways, he's even more paranoid. There's always been elements of paranoia. Right. So how did, it, how did this charge of rank hypocrisy, uh, Karan, affect his reputation and his future work? It um, affected him, I mean, affected all of his readers deeply because of the way in which he talks about speaking the truth uh, and speaking from the heart directly all the time. That's the, that was his particular thing that he had developed in the relationship with his readers that he had developed. And then for them to discover that he had had five children of his own and with one woman and forced her to give every single one of them up was, um, was and remains difficult to stomach for somebody who talks about nature. And as far as I can tell from the three papers you, well, I've read of you three, these children died without trace. They seem to have died. Yeah, and when he was... So I when you say, let's stay on the how it hit his reputation, I know it's right. probably more interesting to talk about them and so on, but how mm. it hit his reputation. So he finds this, and what do people do? Stop buying his books? Burn his books? What do they do? Well, they don't stop buying his books, and his books have already been burnt in any case. So by the, author <laughs> by the authorities, the em Emile has been burnt in Geneva and uh, in Paris, uh, in any case. But that was meant for a religious reason, wasn't it? That was for religious Can you reasons. Br briefly explain that, and then we'll come back to this, these oh, children. Oh, right, yes. So the in Savoyard the, Vicar, yeah. Yeah, in the Emile, there's something called the Profession de Foi du Vicaire Savoyard, the Profession of Faith of the Savoyard Vicar, um, which is something like sort of 60 pages long um, and, and is quite... Inside the book. It's inside the book, and it's quite a sort of beautiful, long sermon, sort of his sermon on the mount, a sort of, again, an amalgam of... Of, of Jean Jacques' views himself, um, and it's all about the religion of the heart, and it's about saying, you know, God is in your heart, you feel Him there, He definitely exists. So his his point was, I am not an atheist, I believe in God, and religion is very important. Um, but he was anti-Catholic, anti-Calvinist, he's anti-organized religion, anti the institution so, of religion. So. All of those people who were in charge of the institutions of religion were absolutely outraged and condemned his book and banned it and burnt it and tried to arrest him, but he ran away, so they couldn't. Can we follow up any more? Have we said enough about these children or, or and the impact it had on him and his writing and his own? So do you want to dwell on it a little bit more? It does seem to me to be a huge bomb that's dropped. I think that there is, there, there's a controversy about what he himself really thought about what happened. So he seems to give about seven or eight different reasons why he did it. Can you give us two or three of them? Well, one thing is that he, he, he claims that at the time he was too poor to take care of them. He claims that he thought that they would be taken care of better at these foundling hospitals, uh, which seems, uh, when you look at the historical evidence, highly unlikely, but who knows what he thought. Um, he also says that he thinks that the, these kids would grow up with the stigma of illegitimacy, uh, that is that his his um, his partner would would be stigmatised, um, and there is quite a I suppose depending on, on on what kind of faith you have in him, there is quite a touching moment in Emil where he talks about um, the fact that if you are going to have children, you must take care of them yourselves, and if you can't, you shouldn't have them, and if you don't, then you will whip you want to say weep um, bitter hard tears mm. and you'll never have consolation. He sort of makes a confession to that in one of his later books, doesn't he? Well, that's, that's it. Well, that's that's a, in, what what that's you've been quoting Mills. from. Yeah. So that's actually before yeah. um, we have this revelation from Voltaire. Mm. So in one sense, you know, you could look at that and he's not exactly um, fessing up, 
But he is, I mean, it's, it's, it's impossible to read that passage, uh, certainly in retrospect, and not think that this, this sounds like, you know, this sounds like um, a kind of heartbroken man. Let's go back to the influence of his ideas. So these ideas are out. We learn that they were very influential on the French, on certain French revolutionaries, and they've been influential on thinkers ever since. What was the power that drove them? Caroline uh, said quite a bit about it. Could you develop that, uh, Richard? In some ways, Rousseau is an author who is successful, like many authors, because the following generation completely misunderstands him. (laughs) And turning him into an advocate of austere Republican morality, which is what the French revolutionaries do, and also an advocate of rebellion against contemporary society. The idea of a revolution in in France, in Paris, which for Rousseau is, is just so beyond the pale it's so corrupt it it would never he would he would argue it, it would never be conceivable so they're going directly against rousseau but they believe that he is the ultimate critic of existing society and therefore if you want to change the world it's rousseau that you go to and and you can see why you know he can inspire people the the sense of passion and the sense of republican pride is there Caroline, back to the title, education. How did the following generation, how did people respond to his ideas in education? Did they did they catch on? Did they change the way young men <laughs> were educated and so on? Um, I, I think in all sorts of um, ways that is true. So, but, and, but to start with the infancy, I think that it started a, a complete change across Europe of, of women, in fact, breastfe- breastfeeding their children. So that's a big change. Um, and I think the idea of exercise was really important. Um, I don't know whether during the, the French Revolution itself and the way that it tried to set up new forms of education, whether Rousseau's ideas were um, adopted in that very much. I don't think that they were. Um, it was more like what he'd written for the um, on Poland, where he talked about how, you know, you try and bring up um, a citizen. You make them love their country and you make them do a lot of collective exercise all in a big field, and then they become <laughs> they full of love for their country. So all of that was very important. I think maybe one other thing is maybe people started writing diaries much more than they... I mean, there never had been this idea of the private diary where you write down your feelings, where you take your feelings and their development seriously um, and you express them. And the more that you write, you know, you develop your personality in connection to a sort of like written version of yourself. You can see how that affects Wordsworth, for example, directly. Yes. And so does it roll on through into the 19th century and through the 19th century, This the effect of his work on the way education was developed? Yes, I mean, yes, I, I mean, I, I, I think so. I mean, you, um, and you can see that even in, 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 in Britain in the way that games become important and all of that sort of stuff, perhaps much more than in, in, in French um, institutions where games are not, in fact, so, so crucial. We've left out the fact that he became a Catholic at one stage and also that he wrote the social contract and there's very little time left. Is this going to be relevant to the education? Is this part of the of the power of Rousseau that, that he's switching between religious, between different uh, sects, you would call them, different sorts of religion and, uh, and also writing about society and the yeah. social contract? Is that powering into the influence he had? Well, I think one way of looking at... Um, so the social contract and Emile... Um, are published within a month of, of each other. Mm. Um, and one of the interesting um, questions to pose about them are, um, do we have there, if you like, different solutions to the kind of problem um, that, that he identifies in the, in the discourse on inequality about the nature of society? So what are we going to do about this toxic society? What are we going to do about this population of, of egotists? Um, and you could see um, the social contract gives you one kind of solution where it involves a certain kind of identification with with your with your state um and then what you look, is that is it possible to 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 summarize that um well i think what is the social what's the essence of the social contract i think i think perhaps the, the most the most important thought within it in a way it's, it's an attempt to to, to make good on a, a kind of republicanism but underpinning it are some very 
um, strong requirements on what has to be in place for this to be possible. So he thinks, just to go back to some of the, the issues that um, Caroline mentioned, there has to be a certain kind of um, patriotism and social identification if that's going to be possible. Um, now, when you look at something like Emil, the, the view there seems to be, well, it would be lovely if we could do that, but we can't because we don't really have that kind of identification available to us. So you can look at Emil as, in a way, offering a different kind of solution to, to the problem of society, um, an attempt to try and make possible, if you like, healthy social relations between, between people, although it's, but though it's very much focused on, if you like, the, the, the way in which um, the upbringing of an individual can lead to this kind of um, toxic mindset or can instead perhaps lead to uh, a more compassionate mindset whereby we identify with one another, we recognise one another's sufferings and so forth. Richard, would you, would you say that the, the business of the five children put out a finding dropped away from him and people just swerved back to his ideas? I think it does. And people read Rousseau and... Not that many people know about his private life. But he doesn't forget it. And for the rest of his life, it marks him. And you also have to remember that when he tries to finish a meal, which obviously is left in manuscript, it's it's posthumously published, he comes to the conclusion that Emil can live everywhere and nowhere. And what that means is that there's no place on earth where you can avoid corruption because Emile and Sophie end up in Paris and everything goes wrong. And Emile abandons Sophie and he travels the world. So he's, he, and he ultimately becomes a slave. He, he's found everywhere. There's no place on earth where you can actually be free from the corruptions of society. Caroline. Yeah, just to, to, to add that the, this is the continuation of Emile called Emile and Sophie, which was not published, um, as, as Richard was saying. So it's not part of the first Emile, which ends on Emile and Sophie being gloriously pregnant. It's, this is the second, the second wave, which was more disastrous. Thank you very much indeed, Caroline Warman, Dennis McManus and Richard Watmore. If you have a topic for our Listener Week uh, in December, please use the contact page on our website or tweet with hashtag IOT Listener Week by the 25th of October. Next week, we're discussing The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. Thank you for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. I want to say that today is the 225th anniversary of the translation of Rousseau to the Pantheon. It was, <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, it was three days. It was the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th of uh, October, 1794. And they're having a ceremony in the Pantheon that involves little children singing to Rousseau's tomb um, and also um, saying poems and various addresses will be made to the tomb and then they'll um, put a bouquet on his tomb. We, we, we missed out his music altogether. He wrote an opera, didn't he, which was quite successful. So many yeah. operas. And he did all the music references in the Great Encyclopedia. He did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why did we miss all that out? Did it not... Did it's it not, not about did, education. Did, yeah. yeah. So that was it, yeah. <laughs> but it, could, it yeah, just a second, hold on. I, I'm, now go ahead this a bit. If it was as important to him as he said it was to him, did, it ma did he make no mention of it in the book? Was this not an important thing for a child to learn about music? It is. It is important, but it's... And actually, music is very important in the notion of natural forms of communication. And obviously, the idea of the tears of a child being a form of communication and the idea that the first humans potentially communicate by song is something that Rousseau believed. And he also thought that uh, operas in French were, were worse than operas in Italian because he thought that actually the Latin language is a more natural language. Yes, what I was going to say, I wanted to fill in what you were saying about the, the language coming from song. It's from his essay on, on the origin of language. And uh, so there's, there's a boy who's come to fetch water and there's a girl who's come to fetch water from different families. They've each got buckets and they see each other and they have this amazing feeling and the feeling comes out of their mouth in the form of song mm -hmm. and they sing at each other. C can I also just go back to, to the tears? Because I, I think there's something that... Um, 
I wouldn't want our listeners to miss out on in in a meal. And there's there's a scene early on, there's a discussion early on, where he talks about the way in which we should react to to the crying child. And you get this amazing kind of psychodrama in that, where the child, where, where the, the big danger is, you're going to tr- you're going to allow the child to think that they can boss you around, mm-hmm. and that they can, as we take that you're so in the, in their in minds the notion that the world is there at their beck and call, and I think that's a, a fascinating discussion. Um, not least because of the ways in which it points us towards some of these discussions of, of if you like, the, the mind of the infant in psychoanalysis, um, but also just this, this amazingly vivid picture of this little tyrant who, um, you know, this potential tyrant, this person, this, this little child will either learn that the world doesn't, if you like, objects don't care, and they'll, they'll have to st- adopt a kind of stoic uh, resignation in the, in, the, in the face of the world around them, or they'll end up thinking that they only have to move their tongue and the, and the, and the universe will respond. So um, that, I was just reminded of that when the, the mention of tears comes up, because I think this is a, an amazing little kind of drama that you get early on in, in Emil. We didn't pay much attention to Roman Catholicism, to which he converted for a time, and which is an ex- extraordinarily powerful institution and uh, and belief system at the time. In in some ways, one of the things that that we've referred to, but we didn't talk a lot about, is the absolute hatred and worry about Rousseau and his possible effects on society, because the reason that Emile's burned is because it's classed as a solvent to religion and government hmm. so to think of it as a you know it's an it's an acid it's a social it's a societal acid it's so dangerous and some of the correspondence when people talk about rousseau they're talking about the devil you know, <laughs> they see him uh, in apocalyptic terms because he'll destroy calvinism catholicism the institutions on which you build society the very education of youth, people are very worried about yeah. the things that he says if they're put into practice, if they're generalised. And to some extent with, with good cause because of the way in which he, you know, he, he leads to... He's, he's a crucial influence on Marx and on brands of anarchism as well. So in, in one sense, if, you know, if these people who are worried about the, the fate of established religions, they are right to be worried about this because certainly you know, through Marx... Um, the established religions really are in the firing line as a result of the kinds of ideas that Rousseau offers, despite the fact that he himself seems to be a very sincere believer. I mean, that said, the sort of um, the sort of ways in which the censorship operated and the things that it said about him, they said about anybody that they wished yeah. to censor. Yeah. They said, you know, there is, you know, endless monstrous vomit coming out of that, you know, is going to drown us all. I yeah. mean, absolutely hysteric. I mean, those exact word for word, you know, hysterical, con- yeah. you know, idea. Because isn't that that's his, just that's his complaint about about his treatment in Geneva, isn't it? That, you know, why are you picking on me? Yeah. <laughs> Loads of other yeah. people are saying, you know, <laughs> similar things or worse things. Well, he can't um, believe that Voltaire's books are being sold in the yeah. city and his are banned. Yeah, I mean, in a Calvinist city, he thinks that that's the ultimate hypocrisy. And because Voltaire was trying to get permission to have theatres built in Geneva, which again Rousseau attacked him for this. What did when to keep Geneva free of, of, of theatres, and they were at each other's throats again. That's, I mean, that's really the source of the antagonism. Is when D'Alembert writes the article on Geneva, and Rousseau thinks that it's it's actually Voltaire's the author, and saying that the Genevan pastors are not Calvinists, mm-hmm. they're Socinian, and also saying that Voltaire and D'Alembert are trying to destroy Genevan morality. You know, that's Rousseau's attack by having a theatre. You can't have it. And that's the source of, of, of so many problems for, for Rousseau over the, over the following years. And then you Did want you to ask him, so, I'm so sorry, but then no, you want please. to ask him, you know, why, if he lo- doesn't like plays, why does he write operas? <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, hello, Rousseau. Yeah, yeah. Yet again, we have one of these sort of paradoxes. And, and I guess another, another thing that's, that's noticeable about the, the literary form of, of Emile, and, uh, and I think this is probably part of the, the reason why it was so important, is that you do get, um, I mean, there's, there's a great kind of poetry and there's a great invocation of this image of the dignity of the independent, rational agent. And um, I think Alan Bloom talks about the, the way in which 
um, sort of earlier forms of, of modern philosophy were kind of competing with the poetry of the classical tradition and the biblical tradition, and they couldn't really compete with the, the if you like, the, the the literary power of those traditions. And then along comes something like a Rousseau, um, who is you know is the most quotable philosopher in history, you might say, and he gives us this this incredibly vivid and incredibly appealing picture of if like of the dignity of 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 of, um, of human beings of in in their in their equality. Men. Dignity of men. Yeah. Just saying. has to be said. Is yeah. he at university? Is he, is he still received with enthusiasm by students, undergraduates today? Oh, I think so. Yeah, um, so. We have on our first year course discourse on, on inequality. Um, and people learn all sorts of things from I mean, they absolutely love it. And they, they un, this, you know, the discussion of amour propre is yeah. very important to them because they, they are in a state of, like, unbelievable anxiety about the idea that they're rubbish and other people are better. So when you say, look what Rousseau's arguing, he says that when you compare yourself to somebody else, you cut yourself in half internally and, and they suddenly <laughs> see it. It's really important. He writes so directly. It's really yeah. great. And he's a brilliant critic of consumerism. You mm. know, so, so, I mean, often when, you know, when, when I teach this material, I, I tell them, you know, you know there are going to be some cookie things here. There are going to be th some things <laughs> you're never going to swallow. But... Um, but, you know, for instance, think about the possibility that some of the desires that you're devoting your life to are counterfeit desires. They're not really setting you free. They're not really making you happy. Mm. I think that's another Rousseauan theme that, that students today definitely connect with immediately. And the love of the environment and animals. Mm. Yeah. Except when he puts the animals out to animal foundling hospitals. <laughs> 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 oh, well, thank dear. you very much. That was terrific. There we are. You've got to be off at Melbourne. Do you want to your coffee? Uh, okay. I'll, have a, I'll have a cup of coffee. It'll be lovely. Coffee? Thank, yeah. Tea, please. No, I shall have prefer tea. Please. A cup of tea would be great. Coffee for me, please. I don't want anything, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Hello, I just wanted to tell you about my new podcast. It's called Classical Fix and it's basically me, Clemmy Burton-Hill, each week talking to a massive music fan. I mix them a classical playlist. They have a listen, they come in and we just see where the conversation goes. If you'd like to give classical music a go but you haven't got a clue where to start, this is where you start. To subscribe, go to BBC Sounds and search for Classical Fix. Now then, as you were.